Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Tuesday, July 9th, 2024, regular closed session meeting of the East Bay Mud Board of Directors. Roll call, Madam Secretary. Director Chan? Present. Director Gomez? Here. Director Katz is en route. Director Lenny? Here. Director Patterson? Present. Director Young? Here. President McIntosh? Here. Uh, if members of the public are online and wish to speak on agenda or non-agenda items, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. Comments on non-agenda items will be heard now. Comments on agenda items will be heard when the item is up for consideration. Madam Secretary, are there any public comments? You have one card for public comment and no hands online. All right. Um, so we do have uh, Yvette Rivera. Come on up, Yvette. And is this on non-agenda or agenda items? That's it, right? Mm-hmm. Just general comments. Okay. Okay. Let me give. Let me set the timer so that you can see it online on the screen. Give me one minute. You ready to go? Thank you. My comments are about the documents. And there is an agenda item that I'll just mention, which is the appraisal for Clifford Chan and Mr. McDonald. And I hope that the board members that are leaving consider whether or not what's been happening at the district for the past, uh, for the past years, um, maybe gets stopped, maybe gets addressed. The document I provided to board members mentions the last time a general manager was ousted, and they ousted Mr. Caruso for, for they cited low morale and persistent problems with Caris, Caris, or Caris, Carrasco's management style, and they voted to oust him. And De, De La Fuente, community leader, cited how well the district was doing financially. So I hope that the district doesn't get lulled into a sense of complacency because you have the people to your left constantly saying how well we're doing financially. Look at the numbers of the people that are resigning and how that impo impacts the district. And look at the lack of diversity. You don't have to look at papers to see that we have little black people, little Hispanic people in positions of power. I'm gonna go ahead and speak at the next board meeting, but I do wanna just end by saying, Director Coleman was, I would say, publicly flogged at the last meeting. The, the report came out and it said that the investigator couldn't reach him, that he inverted some numbers. That was your, your star investigator. And then you were given public comment, uh, a script to talk about based upon that report that didn't include Mr. Coleman's comments. That happened because the people on your left didn't take care of business. Thank you, I yield. Thank you, Eva. Uh, if there are no further speakers, oh, and excuse me for chewing, if, if I don't have a bagel on board day, it's just not a good day. <laughs> The board will now convene to conference room eight to discuss closed session items one and two and schedule to return here for the regular meeting at 115. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Tuesday, July 9th, 2024, regular business meeting of the East Bay Mud Board of Directors. Uh, we will receive reports from this morning's planning and legislative human resources committee meetings under item 24. Roll call, Madam Secretary. Director Chan? Present. Director Gomez? Present. Director Katz? Yes, right, Dir present. Director Lenny? Present. Director Patterson? Present. Director Young? Here. President McIntosh? Here. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, 
indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There is only one announcement from closed session. Due to time constraints, the board did not hold the annual performance evaluation of the general council during today's closed session and will continue the evaluation to the August 13th, 2024 closed session meeting. That moves us to public comment. If members of the public are online and wish to speak on agenda or non-agenda items, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. Comments on non-agenda items will be heard now. Comments on agenda items will be heard when the item is up for consideration. Madam Secretary, are there any public comments online? We have one person online for to comment on consent calendar item number 14. Number 14. Okay, so. And you have one card for public comment on a non-agenda item from Yvette Rivera? I do, and that's the only speaker. At All the right, moment. Yvette Rivera, you want to come forward? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, before I start, I just want to say that I hope that the board president stops Eric Larson from accusing me of presenting anything that's a lie or interrupts my presentation in any way. The board, sh if I were to interrupt anybody at the podium, you would have had security escort me out of this room, especially if I said what they were saying was a lie. So I provided you a document. Actually, I provided you a package. And the package has four documents. I'm only going to speak about one right now. Uh, this morning for Director Katz, I'll leave a document that I provided all the rest of the board members about the past general manager that was fired from the district. Um, and it states why he was fired. And I told the board this morning that um, just because a uh, general manager's budget looks excellent doesn't doesn't mean that they can't be fired. So I'll leave that with you. It also lists um, the uh, Pierce Bland um, argument that on H that uh, Craig Spencer um, violated uh, a financial law. I mean, I, I, I prefer that you just look at the document. So the document that I want to refer to right now is the John Coleman report. Of course, it must have been really a terrible report before he was interviewed because we had four board members that were ready and waiting to deliver that deliver a report of uh, that was uh, created before well actually they were ready to deliver a report that was created that they reviewed and it was created without John Coleman's input there was going to be an open-faced report that was going to be presented. So I did bring it today so that the public knows that it's available as a public document at this board meeting. I just want to read a line of what Director Coleman says in here. Because he wasn't interviewed. And you know we had Director Linney comparing his situation or not disclosing the document, comparing Mr. <laughs> Coleman, a public servant of 33 years to the situation that was happening with Donald Trump. A felon, a felon, 34 counts. He was, uh, I guess, found guilty, but I digress. Let me just read what John Coleman said to give his voice, give him a voice in this meeting. I find this current investigation to be retaliatory in nature, a statement I don't make lightly. My heart goes out to other district employees who may have suffered any kind of retaliation especially any that occurred during my tenure as a member of the Board of Directors. Derek McDonald should have permanently recused himself from this entire situation by December 2022. He did not do so timely nor permanently. I'm going to stop there because you can read the rest. I hope that when the district, the board talks about ethics, it isn't in, the, in terms of retaliation and it's in terms of equity. Thank you. I yield. Thank you. Um, 
that's our only in-person speaker. Um, and we have no online speakers, so let's move on to the agenda. Let's move on to the consent calendar. Items 1 through 16. Are there any comments from the public on consent calendar items? So we have number 4 and 14 that are going to be pulled. Yeah, 4 and 14 are removed. So moved with those two items removed. I second. All right, so we've got 4 removed and 14. All right. So we have a motion and a second for moving the remainder of the consent calendar. Are there any questions, comments, thoughts? All right, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? All right, that moves us to item number four of the consent calendar. Uh, I do have a speaker on item four, and that's Eric Larson. <clears throat> yeah, good evening, Madam President McIntosh, board members, General Manager Chan. My name is Eric Larson. I'm the president of AFSME Local 444, duly elected. Uh, AFSME 444 objects to contracting out installation of rate control stations. Maintenance of regulators at rate control stations is consistent with the core bargaining unit work of our representative maintenance machinists. Installation of regulators at rate control stations is fundamental to proper, regular, and routine maintenance and repair of this critical infrastructure. Installation by district forces is critical to assure proper installation and develop knowledge, skills, and abilities of new maintenance machinists for routine, ongoing maintenance and repair of these devices. It's also more cost effective to have our employees perform this work. We recommend that you defer this work until we have sufficient in-house resources to perform this work. Don't spend this additional $6 million. Plan for this work with the resources we have. I provided these comments during the planning committee meeting, and the response had to do with the critical timing of Coal Creek, which is associated with the Almond Reservoir Replacement Project. But there are four other non-time sensitive rate control stations bundled into this project. Keep this work in house. There's a decade of rate control station work and regulator rehab work projected in the capital improvement plan schedule. We have done this work in the past. We should be doing this work now and we will demand to keep this work into the future. If we need more machinists to do it, separate the Coal Creek project out, reduce the scope, Use the remaining funds to hire more machinists, defer the work on campus, Keller, and Gramercy, and Villarreal until we have sufficient in-house resources. Because after campus, Keller, Gramercy, and Villarreal, we have Knight and Oakmont Park, then Columbia and Henry, then Clayton Fairmont, and then Webster, and then Church, and then Golf Links, and then Victoria, and Nay, and Ascot, and Girvin, and La Loma, and Kensington, and Redwood, and 73rd, and Genoa 1 and 2, and Hollis, and John, and Castro, and Dunsmuir. This is all our work, and it's time to put the brakes on the contracting out. Keep this work in-house. Thank you. Thank you. I guess... Um General Manager, we should hear the response um, that you provided at the planning committee meeting this morning about putting this off. Um, and I don't know if Director Young, do you want? Um, yeah, I can. <clears throat> um, the planning committee heard this item this morning. Um, there was, um, I think, a great deal of sensitivity and support to Eric Larson's comments with regard to figuring out how to bring this work in house with an awareness that <coughs> this current contract, because of the Cull Canyon uh, or Cull Creek um, uh, element being very time sensitive, that um, we, uh, the general sentiment was to proceed. I don't, we did not talk about whether it was be possible to separate out Cull Creek from the other three parts of the project. Yeah, I don't think it would be simple to separate out those particular projects, but what we also talked about the planning committee was 
you know, as you know, um, Eric Larson has talked about, you know, we can have in the next budget cycle talk about, you know, what that staffing need will be. There are many, as Eric noted, other regulator projects and rate control station projects coming up. And so part of the discussion and direction from the planning committee was to continue to engage the unions to have those discussions for uh, possibility for the future regulator projects to be done, um, as well as as we go into our next budget cycle. Um, to look at um, what might be needed if this is the direction we go, so to have those discussions. But for this uh, particular project, the package of projects um, that has already been bid on, um, to the recommendation was to move forward with this project. Okay. Any questions, thoughts, concerns? All right, then why don't we go ahead and vote on that item? Do we have a motion? I'll move the item. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. All right. <clears throat> we have a, and does that include 4.1 and 4.2? Yeah, item four. Yes. All okay. Right. All right. And I, and I would just add, because uh, we did this morning as well, that we encourage uh, staff to continue to have conversations uh, with the unions uh, about uh, the contracting out of future projects. Uh, and while this one came up quite quickly, quickly, uh, uh, you know, we have more time on the other ones and to see if there are some opportunities to do uh, some additional staffing. Uh, in this morning, Clifford had mentioned uh, perhaps in the next budget cycle we can do some planning. And so I'd like to see the, at least the results of that and not have this come back in the future with the sense that, oh, this is too fast, we can't do it. But you know, a sense that, that there's there's at least been a, a, an in-depth discussion of whether it makes sense or not to to use more district forces in these projects going forward. All right, thank you for that, Doug. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that's unanimous. That moves us to item 14. And that is to authorize an agreement beginning on or after July 9th, 2024 with TJC and Associates, Inc. And an amount not to exceed $999,718 for as-needed electrical engineering services during construction in support of the Upper San Leandro Water Treatment Plant Maintenance and Reliability Project. Number 14, that's an online. Yes, so we have Justin Young, and I have a hand up for Josh Alexander. So Justin's hand just went down. It just went back up. Give me one moment. Josh Alexander, are you speaking on an agenda item? Josh Alexander, you should be able to unmute your mic. Josh, your mic is unmuted. Hello, yes, I'm sorry. I must have raised my hand by accident. Oh. I'm not speaking. Thank you. Okay. Justin, you should be able to unmute your mic. And if you're watching online, I'm going to start a um, timer for you. Yeah, I see it. Can you hear me? We can hear you. And your three minutes start now. Engineers solve problems. Engineers solve problems. Good afternoon, Board of Directors. GM Chan, East Bay Mud family, and fellow ratepayers. My name is Justin Young, and I've been an electrical engineer at East Bay Mud for 21 years. Recruitment and retention of electrical and control system engineers isn't a new issue. Local 2019 brought this issue to the board over 10 years ago. The previous GM knew about this issue. Majority of the board of directors knows about this issue. The last Three directors of engineering and construction knew about this issue. HR has been well aware of this issue. Staff who've worked here within the last 10 years knows about this issue. Anyone who looks at the district's job postings knows about this issue. Just look at the job posting now. I just found out right before this meeting yesterday, another electrical engineer submitted the resignation letter. I challenge the district to say what positions have been tougher to recruit 
and retain than electrical engineers. These aren't electrical engineers from one department. District has multiple electrical engineer openings crossing different divisions, design, wastewater, operations. The current contract on consent calendar is $1 million for two electrical engineers part-time for two years to assist during construction at USL water treatment plant. On May 28th of this year, the board approved $1.3 million for configuring and programming electrical equipment the district sole sources. The district is planning to contract out $2.3 million for core electrical engineer and control system work with 1.8 million designated for one project at USL water treatment plant. The quality of engineers performing this work doesn't have district's best interest. The completed work performed has to be corrected by means of change orders or district staff. The commission equipment is handed to FMC without proper in-house knowledge. And this is just a small sample of how the district has been handling business. We can add $2.3 million to the increasing $4 billion debt that could have been prevented. Give electrical engineers and control system engineers the modest two-step equity adjustment like the other water agencies have been doing over the last years. Engineers solve problems. For a company that wants to be an engineering company, from the inside, it seems we're creating more problems than solving. Thanks for the floor. Thank you, Justin. Um, are there any other speakers? No. Um, Clifford, Justin raised a lot of information. So um, is it possible for a follow-up with a memo of some type? We could, or, pro yeah, we could provide a follow-up, but well, I'm, again, I'm just hearing Justin's comments for the first time. What I'm hearing from Justin, and I, I, I am aware that HR is speaking with 2019, but it sounds like what he's asking for is um, an equity adjustment, which is part of the ongoing negotiations. Um, would that it doesn't, have to be it doesn't have to be through negotiations. <laughs> ah, that was sneaky, Justin. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, thank you for your comment. So um, if, if, if that is, in fact, so, then we don't need a memo on it. Okay. All right. We'll wait until the appropriate time. All right, that moves us to our public hearing item. We, uh, oh, we, we need to on. vote. Yes. <laughs> All right, do we have a motion and a second? Oh. <laughs> I'll move the item. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a motion from um, Director Lenny, and we have a second from um, Director Chan. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you. Now we move on to our public hearing. Item 17.1 through 17.3, transfer lanes. This is a public hearing to consider actions related to the transfer of delinquent East Bay mud charges to the Alameda and Contra Costa counties 2024 through 2025 property tax rolls. The public hearing is now open to consider objections and protests to the general manager's report to transfer delinquent East Bay mud charges to the 2024 property tax rolls. We will now hear from the public. Please do not identify, provide identifying information, such as address or phone number. If this information is needed after your comments, you will be directed to contact staff. Is there anyone in attendance that wishes to object or protest the actions being considered by the board? No. Do we have any online speakers? No. All right, and we have no in-person speakers. Staff is located outside the boardroom and can assist anyone with making payment arrangements and provide information related to delinquent charges. All right, so we have no one uh, currently present in the chambers nor 
um, online. Um, may I motion, have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. All right. A voice vote is required. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The public hearing is now closed. We will now move to agenda item 17.2 and 3. Item 17.2 is to adopt the general manager's report dated June 11, 2024, and authorize the general manager to exclude from the report any affected parcels or amounts as appropriate, including those that uh, the district receives payment for on or before August 10, 2024, the date in which the report will be sent to Alameda and Contra Costa counties. Item 17.3 is to authorize the transfer of delinquent East Bay mud charges to the Alameda and Contra Costa's 2024 through 2025 property tax rolls. One voice vote to approve item 17.2 and 3. May I have a motion and a second? to approve 17.2 and 3. I move to approve 17.2 and 3. Second. We have a motion and a second. A motion by, was that Luz? Mm -hmm. Okay, Director Gomez and um, uh, Director Marguerite Young. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you. That moves us to Public hearing, item 18.1, <coughs> wet weather facilities charge. This is to, con to conduct a public hearing and take actions pursuant to Health and Safety Code section 5473 at sequence related to the collection of the wet weather facilities charge on Alameda and Contra Costa County's 2024 property tax rolls. The public hearing is now open. Written protests must have been mailed and received by the district before the close of this public hearing. Madam Secretary, have any written objections or protests been submitted that must be read as part of the record? None. All right. We will now take comments or protests on the report at this time. Please do not provide identifying information, such as address or phone number. If this information is needed after your comments, you will be directed to contact staff. Is there anyone in attendance who wishes to comment or protest the actions to be considered by the board? None. All right. So there's um, anyone online, Madam Secretary? None. All right. So um, there are none in person. There are no speakers online. May I have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. Okay. All right. We have a motion by Director Patterson, Vice President Patterson, and a second by Director Lenny to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The public hearing is now closed. The district has 1,077 um, 907 parcels that are subject to the wet weather facilities charge and amounts listed in the report. The secretary of the district has advised that the district received valid, oh, no, no valid protest from the record owners of parcels listed in the report and upon which the wet weather facilities charge is proposed to be collected on the property tax rolls. Based on the number of valid protests, zero, Submitted prior to the close of the public hearing, a majority protest does not exist for the adoption of the report. The report may be adopted and the wet weather facilities charge may be collected on the fiscal year 2024-2025 property tax rolls of Alameda and Contra Costa counties for East Bay Mud's fiscal year 2025 upon approval by the board. We will now move to agenda items 18.2A through 18.4C. Uh, item 18.2A is to adopt the written report and authorize the district to collect the FY 2025 
wet weather facilities charge on the Alameda and Contra Costa County's property tax rolls by at least two thirds of the members of the board, five board members. May I have a motion and a second to approve item 18.2A? <coughs> I'll second. We have a motion by Director Young, seconded by Director Lenny. Um, 18.3B is to authorize district staff to adjust the FY 2025 wet weather facilities charge for any affected parcels as new information is provided by the counties. President McIntosh, oh. can they can we get the all in favor for 18 point okay. their individual votes? All right. yes. Thought I was just running right through. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so for 18 to 18.2A. 18 mm -hmm. So we have a motion by Director Young. Young, seconded by Director Lenny. Correct. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Item 18.3B is to authorize district staff to adjust the FY 2025 wet weather facility charge for any affected parcels as new information is provided by the counties. May I have a motion and a second to approve 18.3B? I'll move. Second. second. We have a motion by Director Lenny. There was a second by Director Katz and Patterson. Uh, why don't we give that to Andy? Okay. That's good. All right. Uh, we need a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, item 18.4C is to direct the Secretary of the District to file a copy of the report on or before August 10th, 2024, with the Alameda County Auditor Controller and the Contra Costa County Auditor Controller. May I have a motion and a second to approve item 18.4C? I'll move. Second. We have a motion by Director Lenny, seconded by uh, Vice President Patterson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Thank you, board. That was great. We will now move to determination and discussion, and I'll turn this over to General Manager Chan. Thank you, President McIntosh. So um, uh, the board conducts um, each year the appraisal for the general manager and general counsel, as you uh, mentioned earlier. The appraisal for the general counsel has been moved to the uh, first meeting in August. Um, however, the board can still move forward and appoint an ad hoc committee to negotiate any amendments to both the general managers and general counsel's uh, employment agreements. Um, so you, you can do that today if you'd like. Um, so I'll pass it back to the board um, to discuss um, this item. What we've done forever, at least since as long as I've been here, um, the ad hoc committee consists of the current president, the immediate past president, and the vice president of the board. Um, now, if we don't want to follow that model, um, we would probably all be happy if someone suggested <laughs> um, another path. Do we have any volunteers? All right. Seeing none, um, we'll continue the the process. Okay. Yeah, motion. Yes, that's a motion um, for the ad hoc committee. Uh, my second self immediate, <laughs> myself immediate president and uh, immediate past president, Director Katz, and uh, our current vice president, Director Patterson. And yourself. Yes. <laughs> so, what's right. the vote? Yeah, so we have a motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Who made, who motioned in I the second? I made the motion. Uh, okay. Director Young made the second. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> We're not on the committee, so. <laughs> yeah, you okay. made that motion fast and furious. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, next, uh, we have the uh, first reading of the amendments to our wastewater control ordinance. Uh, the changes to the ordinance were discussed with and supported by the planning committee at the June 11th committee meeting. And we have Alicia Chakrabarty, our manager of wastewater environmental services, um, to walk through the updates. Give us one moment, Alicia. Let you know when to click. Let me 
me close my. All right, we're good. Okay, you ready? Oh, beg pardon. I'm going to provide a little bit of background on the wastewater control ordinance and then talk about the drivers for these amendments and go through all of the amendments at a fairly high level. Of course, they're in detail in your packets. So the wastewater control ordinance is the document that um, gives us the authority that we have under the MUD Act to collect, treat, and dispose of wastewater. And I just draw your attention to the diagram on the right. Um, unlike the water system where the district owns and operates all of the pipes, the wastewater, for wastewater, the district owns and operates just the large diameter sewers, uh, pump stations, and treatment facilities, but we do have responsibility and jurisdiction over the entire service area. And the, we the place where that is spelled out is in the uh, wastewater control ordinance. So that has specifications on what can and cannot be discharged by all of the various users including numeric limits, and those are what we call the local limits. Changes to the local limits are what's really driving this ordinance amendment. Um, the wastewater control ordinance has been in effect since 1972, and actually the local limits have been um, in place since 1972 as well. They've only been modified once, and that was in 1990, so more than 30 years ago. Uh, however, they are reviewed every five years. Under our MPDS permit, we're required to look at them. We do a quantitative analysis that looks at the incoming um, concentrations of different pollutants, what can be achieved through the treatment process, and determines whether they're protective. The, this most recent study was completed last summer, and as in past studies, it did show that the local limits are sufficiently protective. However, we also determined that there were a couple of outdated metrics um, that were recommended to be changed. That then initiated a public notification process, which consisted of sending custom letters to all of the wastewater permittees, as well as publication in newspapers in both Alameda and Contra Costa County, and notification to the regional board. That was initiated last fall, um, completed earlier this year, and in March, the regional board provided approval for proceeding with the ordinance amend or with the local limits changes, and um, recommended that we amend our ordinance, which brings us to this first reading. Now, I mentioned that the local limits haven't been changed since 1990. The ordinance has been revised more recently, most recently in 2013. Um, however, that is more than 10 years ago, so we looked at the entire ordinance and are recommending updates actually to every single title within the ordinance. But I draw your attention to the three bolded sections related to local limits, um, permit types. The edits related to permit types are just to give more specificity regarding the actual names of permits and how they're used and then edits to uh, expand the language regarding the appeal processes. So stepping through this, um, the first changes are in Title I. A number of definitions have been updated to more modern terminology, things like replacing the term side sewer, which nobody really knew what that was, with sewer lateral, um, also discharger, indirect discharge, and industrial user, those uh, have been updated for more accurate application throughout the ordinance. Section four, we deleted the requirement for um, submitting applications for new, collection, new connections in duplicate, since no one submits paper applications any longer. And then clarified the language regarding discharge of stormwater, which is generally prohibited. Um, so that is more clear, and it also was expanded, so it includes stormwater, groundwater, drainage water, and now also bay water. As you can see in the figure here, there are some low-lying areas where there's the potential for bay water, so we want to be explicit that that's not allowed. And then we get into the heart of it. In Title II, um, changes were made to replace the term strength, uh, which is really a term referencing the billing constituents, um, the things that are in wastewater that need to be removed, with the more general term concentration, 
as it applies to the concentration of pollutants, the things that are in wastewater that we need to limit. And then edits were made on the section related to prohibited locations to make it explicitly clear that nothing can be discharged to maintenance holes without permission. Um, so this section was specifically broadened to be not just wastewater, but also waste or really any other material. And you'll also notice some other minor changes here, such as replacing the term uh, manhole with maintenance hole. And then we get to uh, the, the really the key change to the local limits. We change the name to local limits to be very clear about what we're referencing, and then two um, substantive changes. So chlorinated uh, hydrocarbons or total identifiable chlorinated hydrocarbons is a grouping of chemicals that was used more broadly in the 1970s. It's not real well defined. Um, and so we're proposing to replace that with a larger grouping called total toxic organics, which is defined in federal regulations. Um, but more importantly, these are essentially the same list of chemicals that we test for in our effluent. So they've got a greater relevance um, for, for limiting. And then the second change is to oil and grease. There's a limit of 100 milligrams per liter oil and grease, we're proposing to specify that that limit applies to only oil and grease of mineral origin, um, like petroleum type hydrocarbons, and then also add a limit for oil and grease of animal or vegetable origin. Uh, that type of grease is less toxic, more degradable, and the 300 milligrams per liter represents what we would expect a well-functioning grease interceptor to be able to produce. Um, title three minor changes were made. This title really deals with charges. Um, one change is to clarify that permitted industrial customers may be billed based on their, their classification or by um, actual analytical data. And then this changed he, his to the non-binary more general, they, their, um, in this section and throughout. And then in Title IV, this is the section that deals with wastewater discharge permits. As I mentioned, this was expanded quite a bit to better explain how different permits are used um, and to actually name them. So the names that you see here, for example, um, are for discharge of groundwater during a construction dewatering project. And we actually are using the names of the permits as they appear in the rates and charges and other documents for better transparency and consistency. Um, some items were added that need to be included in an application, a permit application, as well as explicit language regarding how the district makes decisions about permit applications and what the process is for an industrial user to appeal that decision. Uh, section 5 has been modified to allow the transfer of a permit, provided that the district approves. And Section 6 has been broadened um, from simply termination to termination and modification, and then to also incorporate reference to the appeal process if a user disagrees with the district's decision. Title VI administration, some minor changes were made, including reporting requirements for categorical industrial users. These are the industries that were required to permit under federal regulations. And then um, language was consolidated from Title II regarding confidential information into one section. So now instead of having a separate section on trade secrets and confidential information, it's been merged. And those are the edits you see there. And then under enforcement and penalties, we've specified that notices of violation may be issued. This is not a, not a change, but just it clarifies it in the ordinance itself. And the appeal procedures that appear in this section um, have been expanded for clarity, and they actually mirror the same procedures that were implemented in the regional private sewer lateral ordinance. 
And then almost lastly, um, Title VII deals with the resource recovery program. This is our truck waste program. And this section kind of reads as its own ordinance within the ordinance because the um, regulations and our responsibilities uh, for truck waste are, are distinct from those to piped customers. It has sections on permissible and prohibited discharges, all of the permitting requirements, administration, and enforcement. So we've clarified that discharges are only to designated receiving stations, as well as um, clarified that the district may approve wastes that are trucked um, that exceed local limits, as well as the specific pH prohibition because of their distinct nature. Um, this section has also been modified related to termination and enforcement procedures. So rather than referencing the enforcement procedures that appear elsewhere in the ordinance, they're more standalone, recognizing that they are distinct. And then other minor modifications were made throughout. Um, in 2019, the US EPA and Regional Water Quality Control Board conducted an audit of our pretreatment program. And as part of that, they made a number of recommendations for changes in the ordinance. And we committed to implementing those when we updated the ordinance. So those have been incorporated as well, and some of which I've mentioned already. And then that is the end of the first reading. Um, and then second reading is scheduled for the following board meeting. And the ordinance would then be effective 30 days thereafter. We would transmit it to the regional board and start implementing these new local limits in all existing and new permits. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, the planning committee heard this um, item as was mentioned um, in June, um, had plenty of questions um, about different, more specific elements of it, um, and uh, unanimously um, approved uh, the ordinance, or unanimously recommended approval of the ordinance. Wonderful. All right, so this so is... So I will make a motion. All right. Oh, we don't have a oh. vote. The vote oh, we don't. This is first, first reading. reading. Yeah, introduction and first reading only. All right. Sorry. Thank you for that, though. <laughs> that moves us to item 21. Yes. So um, this is about the governor's policy. At the board retreat last November, the board did ask staff to draft governance policies and set a goal to do so by July of this year. These policies are based on board resolutions and directives, board practices, policies, administrative ordinances, and the MUD Act. We also incorporated new policies based on the feedback that we received from the board during the retreat, as well as subsequent discussions with uh, individual board members, um, as well as we did look at some examples of other agencies' um, uh, governance policies. Um, we did provide a high-level review of the policies at the June 11th Legislative Human Resources Committee um, based on the feedback from the committee, um, we did share the draft policies um, with the entire board for review on June 13th. Uh, Derek has a brief presentation to provide a high-level overview of the 10 policies, um, uh, you know, which will uh, go through fairly quickly. But I really want to focus today's discussion um, on how the board would like to provide feedback on and discuss the policies um, with us. So, Derek. I do have one speaker card. Yvette, do you want to speak before or after? After. All right. Okay. Thank you, Clifford, and good afternoon. Uh, so today we're really just introducing the 10 governance policies to the board, and I am going to give a high-level overview of each, uh, as Clifford mentioned. But we, we, we expect today's focus to uh, discussion to focus on process going forward and how you can best be positioned and have the ability to provide input on these policies, because they are your policies. Um, and, and so moving forward, the, as Clifford mentioned, these draft policies are based on uh, – Quite frankly, a lot of them are based on actual practices and existing board resolutions and past presidential directives um, and reflect the existing practices of the board, just kind of codified into policies. Um, their practices memorialized by the secretary of the district. Um, we've, as Clifford said, we, we looked at policies and administrative ordinances of other California government entities. Uh, and, and putting these together was really a collaboration of myself, the general manager, and the secretary of the district. The next slide, please. There are 10 policies. Uh, eight of them are new, and two of them are existing policies. Uh, the, the ethics 
policy and the reimbursement of director ex uh, expenses policies are existing. And you'll see with the ethics policy uh, that we've taken certain sections out of the ethics policies and rolled them into either their own policies, uh, in the case of the protection of whistleblowers, or move them into new policies where they, the language is more appropriate and not necessarily directly related to ethics. Um, and as you review these policies in uh, electronic or paper format, you'll see that what we've tried to do is highlight on the policies areas in green that really reflect uh, our existing practices. The idea being making it easier to focus on what's new. Uh, that being said, I would encourage you to review everything as time allows. Next slide, please. So the first new policy is the role of the board of directors, and it describes the role and purpose of the board. Uh, it describes the, the board's uh, role and how they work with the general manager, which is really taken from the ethics policy. And then it describes the roles and responsibilities of the board officers, committee chairs, and joint powers authority representatives. And those are taken largely from existing practices. Next slide. The code of conduct is very new. Uh, it is uh, based uh, on from codes of conduct we've seen from other agencies. Uh, and uh, so I would expect a lot of focus on this policy from the board. Uh, it provides general principles of board, board member co conduct. And it provides specific principles of conduct uh, in terms of your interactions with each other, with staff, and when representing the district. Board meetings is largely reflective of existing practices of the board. Uh, it states formally the time and place of regular board meetings and committee meetings, uh, describes the process for setting meeting agendas and the requirement for posting agendas, uh, clarifies that we follow standard uh, Sturgis Code of Standard Parliamentary Procedure and the conduct of board meetings. Uh, it describes the process for providing public comment at board meetings, uh, which is really taken from our website, uh, and the handling of documents uh, provided to the board by members of the public, and there is some clarity added there uh, in terms of how to handle uh, and display documents um, from online commenters. Uh, and it describes a process for addressing disruptions of board meetings, which is really reflective of the Brown Act itself, and so it reflects, reflects the current status of the law. This policy is in the election of board officers and committee assignments. Uh, it describes the process for electing board officers. Again, a process we already file, follow. Lists the qualifications for these positions. States the term of the offices. Describes the process for removal of board officers, uh, which I believe is new, and, and so there should be some focus on that. And describes the process for appointment of committee members and JPA representatives, which is reflective of existing practices. Board member orientation and training. Uh, this has uh, been distilled into a policy. Uh, it, it describes the onboarding and training for newly or elected, uh, newly elected or appointed board members, and it, it specifies the different uh, onboarding meetings that newly elected or appointed members are supposed to have. Uh, it lists ongoing training requirements for board members, which is required by law, uh, and it also states consequences for a board members' failure to complete required training. Some of that is also reflective of law. Next slide. Role of board committees. Uh, this policy, again, largely reflects existing practices, and it describes the roles and responsibilities of each standing board committee, describes the process to create ad hoc committees and the role of ad hoc committees. Uh, it describes board member service on JPAs and other authorities, and it describes the district retirement board and its membership. Next slide, please. The Essex policy, as I mentioned, uh, is an existing policy, so this will be a new, it, this will replace current district policy 6.04 and be slotted under the new number, numbering scheme for the governance policies. Uh, what's new, it adds a mandatory reporting duty for uh, violations of district policy 6.06, .06, equal employment opportunity. Uh, it moves the section on board member general manor, manager relationship to the new governance policy on the role of the board of directors. It removes the section on the reporting of improper activities to the new whistleblower policy, and it removes the section on board member compensation to a new governance policy on board member compensation on benefits. Uh, protection of whistleblowers is extracted from existing policy 6.04, as I just mentioned. It describes the role of the board in ensuring the general manager operates the district according to law, requires board members to report improper activities, and requires formal complaints against the general manager or the general counsel to be reported to the board. 
board member compensation and benefits just clarifies the existing uh, existing practices uh, providing the requirements uh, for board member receipt of compensation and describes the process for adjusting board member compensation which the board uh, at its option goes through every January uh, and describes the benefits received by board members and finally reimbursement of director expenses uh, is an existing policy there's really uh, it describes the board member, there's really nothing new in it. It describes the requirements for board member expense reimbursement. Uh, it includes a requirement that board member expenses not specified in the policy be improved and advanced by the full board. And uh, I will say that the policy itself is quite broad, so that should be a rare occasion. Uh, and require and adds a requirement that board members provide both a written and a public report on conferences attended at district expense, which is reflective of the law. So, so that's my high-level overview of the 10 policies. And uh, if, you know, I'd like to open this up to comment on, on the policies themselves uh, or, or process. Thank you, dear. So didn't we um, determine that we were going, staff was going to mail the policies to each board member? And each board member was to uh, comment prior to today's meeting? We, we did. Um, we sent it out after the Legislative Human Resources Committee. We had asked for feedback by um, the end of June. Um, then we um, sent a reminder and asked for more time. And uh, so what we're recognizing is the board needs more time. And again, you know, for this afternoon, you know, we just like to discuss how best the board would like to provide feedback on the policies um, to get to a point where we can finalize these. Right. Marguerite, it looks like you have, you have some thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, we are looking at a upcoming time when there will be a significant turnover of what has been a very long-standing um, board. And I think a, a uh, internalized, cult, I don't know what the right word is, internalized culture um, way of doing things that we need to actually be, this is very important, um, because it's, you know, there's a, it's, a, it's part of succession, I think, part of succession planning. And I, for one, um, when I got the, the Word document, I was like, this, this is way too long. <laughs> um, and I, I just couldn't focus on it. So um, I, I think there's really, um, what I would propose is that, I, and I do think that we, there needs, rather than it being individual comments and then some kind of, magic, you know, formula stirring of, AI. Well, that, you know, that, that we need <laughs> to do it by AI, um, uh, that um, we should workshop, we should workshop it. Um, and I think that there are, you know, probably four, four pol three or four of the policies that we really do need to talk more about, the role of the board, the code of conduct, um, you know, the board orientation and training and, um, you know, some combination of the ethics and, and whistleblower policy. The rest of it's pretty pro forma, although I, I might take out some of the shalls because shall always to me means there's a consequence and yeah, right. I'm not sure. Some of it's just practice and, you know, good practice. Um, uh, but I know lawyers wrote this. So the word shall is like in the top 10 list of favorite words, right? Um, I love that idea. Uh, so yeah. that, that's my, that would be my suggestion is that we, we do schedule a work, give ourselves the time to do it right, schedule a work. Uh, you know, I don't think it needs to be a long workshop, but um, you know, schedule a workshop on it to work on those several you know, policies. And in the meantime, have each of us commit to some brain power to think about how we sit with what's written now. How does everyone else feel about a, a workshop just for this specific purpose? I mean, I have to, I have to say I do agree with Marguerite, um, particularly in terms of I don't want to rush through this. I don't remember there being a directive to do this by July at the board, at, at the board retreat, but maybe there was. But this is far too important, and we really need – to take time to do it. So my suggestion was going to be, and I'll just throw mine out there with Marguerite's, was um, an ad hoc committee. I mean, this is like, this is a lot for us to go through as a group. Um, and the other one is to go through the finance and admin committee who normally um, 
is responsible for change in policy. And I, and I have to say, having gone through the draft, I think, um, you know, to have Barry Gard uh, Gardein involved would probably be a really good idea. He's been at East Bay Mud for over 30 years. His job has been to work on ordinances, and um, and I really appreciate his work. And um, I find that whenever you know I read his ordinance changes, I don't I don't have very many questions. I think he's always very clear. Um, my concern about what we have in front of us is just it's I feel I find it's very repetitive. I find it's repetitive and kind of vague. Um, so that's my, those are just two things I'm throwing in, uh, but would love to see Barry involved in this. This is his job, so thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. And so, Andy. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in uh, kind, of, kind of in the middle on this. I, I am concerned that if we uh, went straight to a workshop that uh, with the amount of volume of proposed text that we have that all seven of us talking about the entire document in the first instance would be, um, uh, we would exhaust the time allotted for the workshop. But yeah, and President McIntosh has just commented uh, under breath, mess, and I agree. Um, and so, um, you know, but, but I do think that uh, the full board, you know, deserves um, some opportunity to deliberate and the public deserves to see what, what the, that, that um, outcome is, is shaping up to be. So I think some use of, of a, 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 you know, whether it's scheduled in, in our workshop uh, setting in the morning or, or whether it's scheduled in the, the board uh, in, in a afternoon setting, depending on um, the, the stage of, of development that the, the document is in, I'll, I'll defer to um, I'll defer, I think I would defer to the recommendation of an ad hoc committee uh, and the board president's response to that in, in terms of how to proceed from there. But I, I agree with Director Chan that an ad hoc committee or the finance administration committee would, would be a, a better way to start the process and then to make sure that the full board gets a chance to have at it. Um, I also think that the, between, between now and when the, uh, the committee would, would begin work, that we provide an opportunity for board members to give um, potential line edits directly to staff, just so that we can sweep in the really clear um, corrections. There's there's a few um, uh, small modifications that that I spot when I roll through the document. Uh, yes, you know which which sh which shells should be struck struck through and made sh shoulds. You know th those are those are interesting questions. Uh, there's also um, you know what one one very minor example of something that I hope would not be. You know, if everybody flooded the discussion here, you know, like uh, who would be presiding officer, you know, uh, is it always going to, you know, would we want seniority or would we want immediate past as has been our practice? Um, so, you know, that's just one very small example. And uh, I think this is a very good first draft um, and gives, you know, gives us a good starting point. Um, I think what's helpful for this before we conclude this discussion would be an understanding of how does the board want to use this tool? Um, you know, this, this is a way of, I think, capturing the way we've been doing things and the way we think that things probably should keep getting done. Um, I, I'm, I'm not intending for this to be a binding document, you know, that, that a, a, a successor board could not amend, of course. And, you know, any future board uh, can and should amend it to tailor what is best for governance for, for that future board at that time. Uh, but this is our gift to, uh, to future boards to, uh, and to ourselves um, to make sure that what we have carried forward as institutional memory is put, put to paper you know, as we have uh, a, a, a very um, a strong and promising transition. So that, that's, that's my outlook. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, in between on ad hoc versus finance admin. Um, so um, I'll, I'll leave that to colleagues to deliberate. So um, a couple of things. Um, Clifford and I had a back and forth on this. Um, he remembered at the retreat, I don't know if it was just I said, no more workshops, uh, <laughs> we've had enough, or if there was a consensus amongst the board. But regardless, so Clifford's initial response was to try and do this without another workshop um, to his credit so I, I I should probably take the fault for that um, <laughs> so um, and then 
once we had all of this information in front of us, it seemed really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. and, and staff tried to streamline it um, in a way. And Derek, great job, by the way, uh, tried to streamline it in a way that we could take it all in in one setting. And clearly that's not possible. It's, um, it's a lot of information um, and, you know, I think really we should take it in sections. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we could be um, uh, uh, more present uh, in this process if we did it section by section. But um, the next issue um, is that um, if, oh, I stated at our last meeting when we discussed this, that no, we can't bind the hands of future boards. It's impossible for us to do that. A future board could take this document and toss it mm -hmm. uh, if, that's, if that's their choice. Um, or, or, or just toss sections of it or decide that it only uh, pertains to certain circumstances. So that's clear. Um, and uh, the next issue is, so how do we proceed? I, I, I hear you say finance or an ad hoc. So what's the pleasure of the board? If I can have, mm -hmm. um, I, I think there should be a workshop for this. Okay. Um, and, you know, probably it doesn't come first. I think it's a long document, but the parts that I think would create the most controversy is probably an 80-20 rule here that can be applied uh, that only 20% yeah. of this really warrants uh, a, a great deal of examination and discussion. And, and so if you were to assume that that's what the case is, uh, maybe there's an ad hoc or a finance committee that can say, well, at least for session one, Here's the twenty. Here's our ses, uh, a sense of what the twenty percent is that we should really examine, uh, and and go with something like that. So we have it narrowed down, and that we can uh, do a deep dive in uh, those sections that that deserve uh, the the time, uh, and maybe by that time we'll be either exhausted from that and say, hey, this is fine. The rest of it, or we'll say, okay, now. We've got the tough stuff out of the way. Let's have another session, or let's use some board time to uh, to take care of the rest of it. So I I, I kind of think there's a hybrid there somewhere. Okay. So, you, what's your? I mean, I'm I'm fine with the finance committee myself. Okay. Doing it. Are yeah, I'd say finance or an ad hoc. I mean, the the an ad hoc committee um, has it seems like a little bit more. I mean, finance is like it's got this agenda and then you've got 20 minutes or whatever it is, right? Um, maybe it could be a longer meeting, but with an ad hoc committee, there's a, seems like there's a little bit more flexibility to kind of, you know, dig in to... And it's the only thing on the agenda. Yeah, and, and then you present, it's, you know, it, you're, present, you're kind of creating a work product that then is presented. So, I, and I agree with Doug, I think, you know, I really think there's like three things three areas of this whole package that really need the most attention um, in terms of kind of capturing current best practice, the, th the lessons that we've learned in the last few years, and, um, you know, as instruction to future boards, whether they want to, you know, keep it or toss it or whatever, at least, you know, somebody besides people sitting up here should be, well, 30 years ago, we did it this way. Um, <laughs> And you know we're losing that. So um, we're 20 years ago. Um, so I, I, I guess I'd slightly bend towards the ad hoc committee preparing something that then gets workshopped for the whole board. Doug, I, I just one of the question is just the the timing on this. Again, I don't remember the July. I don't remember <laughs> if there was a reasoning for the July. If there, there was, uh, and. Yeah, so there's just a question. I think it was just what, so that we it? did it. Yes, so we did. That's yeah. what I kind of think. Too. I think that's what it right. was. And, and my, my, recollection, no my recollection of the discussion when you set the July deadline was to get it done before the, the filing period so that any new board members are filed at least can see how the current. That, that was the discussion that I recall that we had at the retreat. But again, there's nothing magical about mid July. 
Well, and I don't think there's anything in the policy that is so, you know. Yeah. All right, April. Oh, okay. Um, definitely I could go either way if it's ad hoc committee or, or uh, finance administration, but just want to point out that really this is kind of the role of the finance administration committee to be looking at policy. Um, and secondly, I... I'm on that committee. I would be open to more meet to a meeting or two that's extra because of this, but that's just me. So I can go either way. But it is it is kind of the role of that committee. Lose. I was mm -hmm. just going to say that as the newest board member, I was I was looking for something like this and there were some policies that were in place that I definitely referred to as I was embarking on my new journey so so I'm really happy that we're doing this and and when I did get this it did seem a little overwhelming so I I, I welcome anything that we can do to make the process of all of us being involved a little bit easier I I like the idea of an ad hoc because of what others have said that it would allow us more time to really digest things and to make a recommendation to for a workshop well, um, we can oh, do that without the things that would go on a work, you know, what what is it that we really should be discussing further? Um, and then in terms of timeline, I do think we ought to decide to do this before maybe a whole bunch of new potential new board members arrive. So if we could do it by the end of the year, that would be a recommendation. So um, based upon the comments of, of um, everyone, uh, you know, I would move to create an ad hoc committee we do have one to review time. this. I know, we have a speaker. Um, and uh, Yvette, do you want to speak before the vote or after? Okay, come on up. And if I can just note a logistical yes. issue, a compliance issue, uh, Director Chan and myself could not both serve on an ad hoc committee, so we, we seem to both have some interest. Um, uh, I'm, I'm interested in who else is interested in... in, in uh, working on this and that may affect who, you know, whether we go with an ad hoc or whether we go with finance administration, okay. but I thought we should clarify that that um, uh, both April and I couldn't be in an ad hoc at the same time. Um, of course, if Director Young were to participate, we would need I, to use I'd like ad to hoc. be on the ad hoc. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe we should just send it to finance. That's fine. Well, I, I was pointing out that, okay. 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 All right, you bet. Your time is gonna show on the screen. Um, I think it would be great if it was part of the finance and administration uh, committee meeting because obviously it will move to, sounds like, a workshop. And I really appreciate hearing everybody pressing the pause button on this process. Um, I've spoken about this before, that my biggest concern is that these proposed board policies were designed to enforce group speak to ensure that not that no one board member could request in a public meeting that the stop or pause button be pressed, lest they be publicly accused of violating one of these proposed policies. I appreciate that um, the policies will go into effect before the end of the year, but it really sounds like 10 policies are overkill. Imagine you walking in the door and having 10 policies. Because several board members mentioned that the must word would be removed, I have less concerns about the minefields that I felt were intentionally being created. But there are already ethic laws, training requirements, board policies, and policies at the district and other policies of the district that the board members are supposed to adhere to. It doesn't make sense why the board of directors isn't moving towards creating a board of director best practices manual. Any new board member would benefit from institutional knowledge and you know, a pamphlet, a manual, a book would definitely clarify what their scope of responsibility is. Again, I have concerns about 10 policies being created, and I think it's designed to prevent individuals from 
voicing their concerns and pressing that pause button or that stop button. That's all I have for right now, and I look forward to being in those future board meetings. Thank you. I yield. Thank you. Um, if Andy. I could just respond. Yeah, not a question. Uh, uh, thank you, Ms. Rivera. Um, I, I just uh, took your comment, and it jogged my memory a little bit because I read this about a month ago. And uh, that jogged my memory in terms of one of the, another example that I think is probably something that a committee shouldn't seek to resolve all on their own and really does need to be referred to the full board. One of those examples is agenda setting. And that's when, when Ms. Rivera refers to, I, I, I disagree um, based on, you know, the, the full deliberations of our board retreat and the, the spirit of the intent that we directed this work to happen. Um, I, I, I don't find that there's any uh, nefarious intent in the drafting here. Um, I, you know, I, I, I respect uh, uh, the, the opinion of those who uh, are reading it in their own way, but I, I find that it's just an attempt to, to draft things as a policy. It's written very lawyer-like, and that does tend to result in construction that's very strict. Um, but, but what I, I do find some consequences of that strictness in the structure of agenda setting, and I, f I feel like our, um, our, 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 our practice and what is the ultimate... Um, uh, you know, uh, 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 all of the nuances of, of courtesy of agenda setting um, are, are, are much more complicated. Um, I am concerned that a minority or, you know, even a solo board member would not have the ability to um, uh, raise an issue for agenda setting. And that uh, it has, has usually been a, a more of a, a careful, nuanced discussion between the board president and interested board members with staff involvement. And there's a slightly different story for all sorts of instances. Um, so, but, but the way the policy is written, uh, you know, I, I had concerns about that. And that's, and, you know, I want to thank Ms. Rivera for reminding me about that particular example as an example where uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I, I, would, I would expect that, that any, whichever committee is looking at this would, would say, uh, yeah, we're, we're not going to fix this with drafting. Let's, let's get a policy decision from the board about what we want. Um, but, but, you know, uh, like Director Linney said, probably 80% of this, maybe even more, uh, is our drafting, you know, uh, uh, questions where we can just strike through, you know, li line through it and, uh, and, and make some clarifying changes. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. On that. Uh, All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andy, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm listening carefully, but I'm not following you when you're saying the issue you're addressing is that maybe one person can't. Ask for an agenda item to be on when you say I, setting the agenda. What, yeah, what, so so I, I don't recall the precise rule, and, <laughs> and uh, my apologies for recalling something that we didn't all necessarily recall because I remember reading that and going, "Oh, that's a significant change." But the the proposed governance <clears throat> policies um, actually would, uh, uh, you know, we, we always have a, a rule that the pre that the president sets the agenda. But, but I feel like we also have an informal rule that eventually a, a, an individual member um, uh, gets their uh, voice heard through the agenda process after working with staff. Um, so I think I think that's something to work through. I think that's an actual so like a, a how to yeah how we do agenda setting. I think is um, is something that is not just a drafting fix that, you know, I think we need more direction from the board on that specific area. So I, I you know, I, I, without like, you know, I, I'm not inviting us, you know, at, at 2.49 to, to start um, Thank you. solving that particular issue, but that's just an example of how a committee should scope what they will attempt to solve mm -hmm. themselves and what will be referred to the full board for uh, a more, a more um, a deliberative policy direction to be drafted. Marguerite. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, I guess I would uh, uh, generalize Andy's comment to be that part of the ad hoc committee's charge, or the finance committee's charge. Sorry, if we go that direction, um, would be to um, identify what the you know, philosophical questions are. Um, you know, the the choice paths that we have um, to make around certain things. I mean, one of the things I identified was that there's very little about our relationship with our constituents um, that's in the policy. It's all very mechanical. Part of the role. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, there, I think there's things like that that are in there that are, that are uh, 
you know, more sort of philosophical and actually do, um, you are be surprised um, that, I, you know, I do think as we conceived of this and talked about it, that we weren't really talking about an ordinance or policies as much as we were really actually talking about a board member handbook or, you know, uh, uh, guide. Um, if it comes out as policies, that doesn't, you know, doesn't bother me. Um, but it's a way of arranging the, the information so that a board member can go, okay, where do I fit into this big organization and go through um, what seem, I don't know, comes across to me as a pretty, cl you know, s clear table of contents is how I yeah. think of it. And if I could just uh, respond, and I know Ms. Rivera raised the issue of a handbook. There is a handbook in de development, uh, and Risha, please feel free to fill in the details. Uh, the handbook is going to be based on the policies. Uh, but then it also provides a lot more details for board members on things that aren't necessarily, you know, they're more administrative. Um, and, and so the end result of all of this will be complete policies completed by you uh, and then an update to a handbook that will incorporate the policies and, and all of the detail that you probably don't want to review in an ad hoc committee or otherwise. So, all right, the question before us before we move on to item 22 and we have a number of speakers um, on that issue so do you want an ad hoc committee or should we take it to the finance committee do we have any motions and if I can sorry weigh in on that um, we did not agendize the appointment of an ad hoc committee today because okay. we didn't want to box you in and weren't sure where you were going to go so if you want to appoint an ad hoc committee that will need to be an item for the August 13th meeting all right so, so, but you that, can send it to the finance that. committee right so you we can, can send it you can send it to finance without without all right so we can move along I would move okay? that we send it to finance or we don't have to do a motion the, ch the president can just direct it to the finance committee yeah, we, yeah. Can, we can do that. But I, I guess I would ask that everybody does take a moment between now and the next finance committee meeting a half an hour of their time to actually, you That's know, make some specific. notes and questions and other things that are important. During our them. vacation, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it really would be helpful to get all of your feedback uh, ahead of the finance committee meeting. Um, just send that to us in writing and, and we will Which figure is the out second. A Second meeting. It's the second. It's the second yes. meeting in the month, and I, I'll share with you. I did look at the the board calendar, and you know, we can do it in the finance administration. Just you know, uh, advance warning. Um, it will be a longer meeting because those those finance administration committee meetings coming up are um, full. So we'll just have to extend it by an hour um, for that discussion. But it sounds like there's commitment from the so committee we'll have to, to start do at seven thirty in the morning <laughs> instead of the how about eight o'clock. How about eight o'clock? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, well, what's the in the second meeting of the month? There isn't anything besides. Usually, that. there's not. So we can we can go longer nine nine to eleven. So normally we go from ten to eleven for finance administration. We can start an hour earlier. We could, yeah, we could also explore um, you know uh, scheduling a special meeting if that's what works better for the committee. I think so. All right, so let's move along. Okay. okay. So just one. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is that the the objective here of having a committee look at it first is to help determine which of those items that the full board is going to look at, but not necessarily to make suggestions or changes themselves. Is that right? Yeah, identify the key identify topics. Identify the key yeah. topics. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's all. I think we, we, might, we might proceed to solve things that, that are, you know, drafting ambiguities or, you know, the, the, the small, like the 80% 80, the 80 that we don't think needs. Um, okay. All right. Andy Thank wants you. to oh. march through those shells. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> Without today. taking too much time at the full board. Yeah. All right. That takes us to item 22. Yes. Um, so uh, for this item, this is a discussion on the certification of the final environmental impact report for the Walnut Creek Water Treatment Plant Project. Uh, just as a reminder, at the June at the June 11th um, board meeting, the board asked staff to meet with the concerned neighbors of Akalani's Ridge and bring this back, uh, this item back for the board to discuss today. Uh, we did have two productive meetings with the community to hear their concerns, further discuss the project alternatives and seek to understand the issues. I do wanna thank the neighbors. I wanna thank staff for taking the time and effort to have this dialogue. 
I also want to thank Director Gomez for her involvement on this project. Um, last week, uh, we did receive a letter from the neighbor sharing that they feel that they did make a strong case to build a pretreatment facility at a location other than Walnut Creek Water Treatment Plant, but that they would consider ending their pursuit of that goal if we would consider addressing several of their concerns. Um, at your places is our response to the neighbors um, that we share with them uh, today, because uh, we just had finalized that today. Uh, we do. Um, oh, that's this. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and so we have Bill Majori, our senior civil engineer uh, in the planning department division. He has a brief presentation to review the project, uh, some of the discussion that we have with the neighbors, and next steps. And then I do have three speaker cards um, Norman Matloff, Julia Jackson, and Arvin Malia. And my understanding is you want to speak after the presentation? No. You want to speak now? No. Okay. All right. Um, then we'll wait for the presentation. Let's start with Norman Matlaw. Oh, okay. Then Julia Jackson. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Julia Jackson, and I live at the corner of Alfred Avenue and Larky Lane at the entrance to the Walnut Creek Treatment Plant. On Friday, I did email the Walnut Creek uh, Pretreatment Project mitigations to you, and hard copies have also been provided. These nine items are reasonable and drastically would drastically reduce our future complaints. Uh, this morning, we did receive the response to those um, to that document. Um, I still believe that more work needs to be done in this response. Um, as a neighbor, we have borne the impact of the water treatment plant for years. The continual tanker, truck, and other vehicular traffic starting before 11, uh, pardon me, before 7 a.m. and continual throughout the day, including the associated noise and pollution. Now you plan to build a pretreatment plant on this narrowly configured 50-acre parcel. We are arguably the most impacted residential neighborhood in the entire East Bay mud system. We deserve better than indifference. The FEIR is deficient when it comes to health and safety protections, and alternatives such as Bixler and Lafayette, neither which is residential. This pretreatment project is not a good example of East Bay Mud being a good neighbor by more industrialization of our neighborhood. Board, today we are standing and asking for reasonable mitigations, and we just ask that you give them serious consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Norman Matloff. Sorry, I don't have my, let me have. All right, I have to apologize first um, in advance because I had another entirely different presentation ready. Uh, the, the message this morning uh, that was just alluded to about um, the response to our request for mitigation uh, entirely changed things. So my original message was going to be pretty conciliatory. Um, I'm sorry, this one won't be. We asked, number one, among the mitigations, something entirely reasonable. One of our major problems, as Julia just said, was all that traffic going through one street in our neighborhood. And a lot of that traffic was removal of sludge. Okay. We had uh, an idea which came from a water treatment engineer, not, you know, somebody that doesn't know anything. Pipe the sludge away from the plant to a remote location where it's picked up by trucks. Eminently reasonable and doable. To see the message this morning that summarily dismissed that, 
was, was pretty shocking. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't agree that the meetings were productive. They were anything but productive. The last meeting, it, it was just extremely frustrating to us. And here's a case in point. In response, last week, we actually brought up this idea of piping the sludge down the hill. OK. Um, there was a response then. Oh, no, that would waste too much water. Well, what do you know? Now in the message today, they admit it's only 30 to 40 acre feet per year. That's literally a drop in the bucket. It's nothing. All, and so that thing that we heard last week about is wasting water you know, is, is totally false. Not to mention all the fuel that's wasted for those trucks laboring up the steep hill. All right. The reason I'm so wrought up about this is that this has been a pattern in practice. Hiding the truth, selective presentation of facts, and above all, a mentality of saying no, no, no. Even to something as small as this mitigation proposal. It's just outrageous. Uh, you know, you can see my gray, gray hair. I'm kind of old. I retired last year from uh, UC Davis after 48 years, believe it or not. I saw a lot of dirty politics there. I'm also a political writer. And I've written about stuff in Congress. I've testified before Congress and so on. I'm sorry. This is the worst I've ever seen, frankly. Mr. Madloff, your time is concluded. All right. One more thing. Please make it work. Please tell East Bay Mud, you the board, make it work. The piping idea can be done. It doesn't have to be done at 1810 Geary. It can be in Lafayette, wherever it is. Please make it work. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker is Arvin Malia. Good afternoon. Your time is starting on the screen. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. I'm Arvin Malia, electrical engineer. I live on Alpert Avenue, Walnut Creek. Here are some of my comments. First of all, yes, the meeting was not productive, the last two meetings. Our interaction with East Payment staff was a lack of notification, poor to no audio on the audio conference calls, not wanting to interact with us until Luz Gomez uh, came on board. No attempt was made to meet with us despite repeated requests. It was clearly dismissal of the neighbors of Aklanis Ridge, and we feel unprofessional and unneighborly. I worked all my life in a professional environment. This one was the worst. The founders of East Bayward had a vision, bringing pristine snow melt water to the Bay Area. We now have a management and staff who have no long-term vision. We refuse to consider the Bixler residing option, safer, cheaper option with room for expansion away from a densely populated Bay Area cities. We also note the chain of mind away from expanding Lafayette and Orinda, I think you're already planning that, which is our, one of our suggestions, by the way, because it's a better alternative. I know we do not agree that Big Slow is not a viable alternative. There seems to be no clear long-term planning for the improvement of the water system. I'm afraid to say that. Traffic is a major concern. The staff here uh, mentioned button hook turns. These are turns which are made sort of unsafe turns, okay? But forgot to mention that there is no dividers on Larky as a dangerous intersection with a culvert and a ditch on the left, a utility power pole uh, on the right. In the past, East Bay mud truck hit a power pole and killed the dog. That's another accident waiting to happen here, I'm afraid. There are many forums and ongoing legal discussions on the unsafe of button hook turns. You can watch the videos of your trucks making unsafe turns on YouTube. We have put it on YouTube now. This massive project does not belong uh, in our restricted neighborhood, access restricted. Mr. Chan and his staff 
continue to disregard their own earthquake studies in favor of consultants' reports. You just want to get your EIR through. The significant fire concerns mentioned in the EIR should have clearly stopped the project. These studies and alternatives continue to ignore. Furthermore, with the recent fire which is happening right now in Thompson, Orville, it's unconscionable knowing all the dangers it poses to the residents, you would consider this massive project uh, and in this earthquake and fire danger zone. Well, at this stage, we are seeking a few major mitigation concessions. Uh, please refer to Julia Jackson's, you know, you have the document. I hope the board, board will honor our request and upend the EIR. I urge the board to vote no and tell the staff to go back and look at the alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's... So we do have Bill here um, who can address a number of the issues that were raised. Um, and why don't we start with that presentation and then we can move on to additional discussion. Okay. okay. Good afternoon, President McIntosh, members of the board. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I can click. Oh. Okay. Okay. So uh, Clifford introduced the project, but I'll go over the agenda here. So um, I'll go over the update on the community dialogue that we had, uh, future project outreach, and I'll review the schedule and next steps and the recommended action. Uh, so we had two community meetings, um, one on June 21st and one on June 27th. Uh, the purpose of the meetings was to seek to understand neighbors' comments on project alternatives and to continue conversations and engage in a meaningful dialogue about the neighbors' issues and concerns with the project. Staff reviewed the project alternatives that were analyzed in the environmental impact report. Uh, since 1999, uh, district staff have evaluated multiple alternatives for pretreatment to address changes in source water quality. Uh, two of those alternatives were off-site alternatives. Uh, one was, is called upcountry pretreatment at Bixler, and I'll talk about that shortly. And then uh, another one was pretreatment of Freeport water near Comanche Reservoir, which was eliminated because it could only uh, treat water from uh, Freeport. And then we also reviewed the alternatives that we had developed at the Walnut Creek Water Treatment Plant. Uh, I will say that we did talk about the Bixler alternative um, back in a community meeting in May, and we prepared a subsequent uh, fact sheet explaining why we eliminated it, and we shared it with the board uh, as well as the community. So this, these last two meetings were really focused on getting into the details and answering their questions about why the Bixler alternative was eliminated. Uh, so. Um, in, in the last two meetings, the neighbors continue to recommend uh, that we construct pretreatment at the Bixler site instead of the Walnut Creek Water Treatment Plant site. Now, um, the Bixler site is located approximately 30 miles east of the Walnut Creek Water Treatment Plant. Uh, it's located on district-owned property uh, next to the McCullum Aqueducts, and it's in the delta. Uh, you can see the delta in this map. There are three stars down here. I'm just Please ignore them for now. They, um, they're, they're errors that occurred kind of in the final hours of putting this presentation together, but I'll walk you through where these facilities are. Um, in addition to a pretreatment project at Bixler, uh, the community also recommended a full conventional water treatment plant there, um, th uh, presumably to uh, allow us to take Walnut Creek Water Treatment Plant out of service for normal operation. Uh, both of the, uh, the proposals do not meet our project objectives in that they cannot treat um, all of our water sources. Uh, in particular, Brioni's Reservoir, and, uh, which is located right here, where I've got the arrow here. And then the Contra Costa uh, Water District Raw Water Intertie, which is located next to the, the McCullum Aqueducts right here. Um, in addition to not meeting those objectives, um, the, both of the, pro uh, the proposals pose operational uh, risks associated with the location of a treatment plant at the Bixler site. Um, the community did ask if we can mitigate those um, those risks, uh, and we shared that although we can we can mitigate them, we cannot completely eliminate them. Um, and then, lastly, the Bixler uh, uh, pretreatment project at the Bixler site is significantly more expensive than at the Walnut Creek Water Treatment Plant site. Now, through these um, 
meetings, the neighbors did acknowledge that they understood that the Bixler site cannot pretreat water uh, for Brioni's Reservoir and the Contra Costa Water District intertie, but questioned <laughs> whether we needed those supplies and whether we needed to pretreat those supplies, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, so uh, we did share information on our water supply system, um, in particular about Brioni's Reservoir. Uh, Brioni's Reservoir is one of our five terminal reservoirs. It's our largest at approximately 40% of our terminal reservoir capacity. Uh, and it um, is the only terminal reservoir that could supply the Walnut Creek Water Treatment Plant, uh, it can, as well as the other inline plants. Uh, we use it uh, every year. Uh, in 42% of the days over the last 10 years, we've utilized the Brioni's Reservoir uh, to supply our treatment plants. Uh, in addition to normal use, uh, Brioni's Reservoir is an important emergency supply for us, as well as all the terminals. Uh, if we were to lose our McCullamy supply um, through the McCullamy aqueducts, through a failure of one or more of the aqueducts, we would rely on our terminal reservoirs to meet our demands. Uh, and then lastly, the Brioni's uh, Reservoir does provide some drought storage. Now, with respect to water quality, Brioni's Reservoir has historically had very good water quality. Uh, but in recent years, we have seen algal blooms in the reservoir um, that haven't, um, haven't diminished. Uh, in addition to algal blooms, uh, we have had some high turbidity events in Brioni's Reservoir. On the bottom right-hand side here, you can see a picture of Pardee Reservoir in February 2017, where we had an atmospheric river. Uh, Pardee had high turbidity. Brioni's also had high turbidity at, this, at the same time, just not as bad as Pardee. Uh, so we, we explain these source water quality events to the community um, and also explain our big picture, all of the source water quality issues we're, we're seeing across all of our water supplies, um, which are primarily driven by uh, high rainfall events and, and droughts, as well as the fact that we've had some near-miss wildfires in the McCallum watershed above Party Reservoir. So we've seen these increase over the last 10 years and we expect they will continue to increase as a result of climate change. Um, we did share more background on the Contra Costa Water District intertie with, with the community. Um, it is not normally a uh, used facility for us. Uh, it is an emergency, sub, potential emergency supply. It's our largest intertie that we have with the neighboring water agency at 45 million gallons per day capacity. And we would presumably use it if we had, a, similar to Brioni's, uh, a loss of our McCullamy supply. So it's an, uh, it's an emergency supply. The Contra Costa Water District does pretreat their own water. Uh, they need to pretreat their own water, so we would as well. Um, so in addition to answering questions about why we needed to treat the, those two water supplies, we did have some um, dialogue on a couple of other issues, and I'm going to highlight the, the major ones that we talked about. Um, the neighbors did ask about our long-term plans for all of our water treatment plants. Um, uh, in our investments and whether we would need to do those investments if we built pretreatment at the Bixler site. And we, we shared that information and confirmed that we, we would need to make those investments regardless of whether we were to build pretreatment at Bixler or at Walnut Creek. Uh, they asked if we could find another site somewhere in Arinda or Lafayette at one of our other facilities to build the pretreatment facilities for Walnut Creek and we confirm we don't have any available space at those sites. Um, they shared a concern that they have about earthquakes, that an earthquake could cause damage to our facilities, and it's a risk, um, a safety risk to, to the neighbors. We did share that um, all the facilities that we have at the Walnut Creek treatment plant and all the facilities we will build are designed to withstand a major earthquake on any of the active faults in the Bay Area, including the Hayward Fault, which is 10 miles away. Uh, and in a, not only withstand an earthquake, but also to continue to operate through it because we design our facilities to a higher standard than other buildings. Um, they shared a concern about evacuation from, from the neighborhood uh, after an emergency. Um, the example that we talked about was a wildfire. Uh, we did share that we do have a site-specific emergency action plan that um, has um, that our operators have that identifies a range of actions that they, are, they should take under different emergency scenarios. And we specifically talked about the wildfire event. Um, our operations staff 
Um, I, the concern was that if we are going to be evacuating, we would interfere with the evacuation of the residences. And our operations staff shared in that meeting that they actually would shelter in place and continue to operate the water treatment plant, and they would not be evacuating because our facility is, we, we manage the vegetation on our 50-acre site. There's defensible space, and the buildings are made of fire-resistant materials. So they would stay and continue to operate the plant, and so they wouldn't interfere with the evacuations. Is that a written policy? Um, I'm not. Shelter in place on I'm, this? I'm state? not certain about that, yes. But uh, the, our operations supervisor was at the meeting, and he shared that information. All right, because it's just, you know, one can say anything, but right. is it the absolute truth uh, of the matter? Um, do yeah, you so, know? Yeah, so we do have, um, not only within our emergency action plan, but within the emergency action plan, we have various annexes for different types of disasters. Earthquakes, wildfires are some of them. And then also for these type of facilities, there's a, what we call a site-specific emergency action plan. So. Thank you. Um, the neighbors did express concerns about the long-term truck trips to and from the site, particularly from the tanker trucks that are involved in delivering chemicals and off-hauling sludge. And I'll share with you what we explained in the meeting using the table um, on the screen here. So I'll, I'll kind of walk you through the table. On the first column, we have vehicle types. So workers, chemical delivery, sludge off-haul. And then in the table, we have the frequency um, of the, the vehicles. And these are average annual numbers. So some days are higher, some days are lower. So under existing operations, that's the, the second column. Typical post-project operations, that's what happens after we build pretreatment at Walnut Creek Water Treatment Plant. But it also accounts for future projected demands and future changes in water quality. So higher turbidities than what we've seen in the past. And then the last column is um, what we would expect to see if we did not build pretreatment, uh, but we would still have the higher average turbidities and the higher demands. So for chemical deliveries, um, our existing operations on average is two per week. Um, after the project is built, sorry, this is the second error the, in the last, I promise, it's actually four per week after we build the pretreatment uh, project. Um, and that's to deliver the additional chemicals associated with the pretreatment process. And then la the last column says it would be two per week if we didn't build the project. Um, but the more uh, frequent truck traffic that we have is sludge off-haul. So you can see that chemical delivery existing is two per week. Sludge off-haul is two per day. Um, so currently, it's on average two per day, and it's wet. And what I mean by wet is it, the sludge is in a liquid form, and, we, and, it, uh, and therefore it goes into a tanker truck. Um, after... If we were to build the pretreatment project and after we were to build it, um, it would be three per day, but it would be dry. And what that means is we have this mechanical dewatering um, part of the project that's going to remove liquid and recycle it, but it's going to leave a, a, what they call a cake. Uh, and, it, and instead of going into a tanker truck, it goes in a smaller dump truck. Um, so it goes, so the, key, the two key things is it goes up to three per day, but it's in smaller trucks. How uh, smaller? Uh, so the existing tanker trucks are approximately 63 feet long, and these are 27 feet. Um, so, and then after, if we were to not build the project, the, the truck trips would be nine per day. And so that's because, um, again, we're accounting for future turbidity, and future demands, and those would be wet. So I, the key message we were trying to get across um, was that the project actually does some good things in terms of truck traffic. It, it gives us smaller trucks for sludge. And when you compare an apples and apples situation in terms of turbidity and demands, it actually reduces it. Um, but uh, it does increase it over, the, over time because of those changes. Okay, uh, on the smaller truck <clears throat> issue, one of the videos and, and one of the concerns that's been expressed is the Right hand, I guess it's a right hand turn, the mm -hmm. wide turn. Would the 20 foot truck be able to make a standard right hand turn? Uh, definitely easier than the tanker, but I'm not sure. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. clearly easier than yeah. the tanker, but whether right. it would still cross the lane or not. I, I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, so 
that a lot of the dialogue back and forth was on those key questions as well as, as the Bixler alternative. Um, we concluded the, the last meeting and outlined the future outreach for the project, um, which would include future community meetings through uh, both design and construction. Um, we do have a community affairs representative assigned to this project uh, who will be available to the community if they, uh, the neighbors if they have any questions. Um, all the way from planning, design, construction, and also operation. Uh, we'll continue to update the project website through design construction. Um, the community affairs representative will notify um, the neighbors if there's any potentially disruptive activities approximately two weeks in advance. These could be days with lo uh, lots of uh, trucks, concrete pours. Um, there will be a project sign at the entrance with the contact information for the community affairs representative in case uh, somebody who doesn't know how to get a hold of, this, of the, the community affairs rep uh, has an issue that they want to express about the construction activities, and the community affairs representative would work with the construction management team to resolve it. Um, so schedule and next steps. So the, the final EIR that was published at the end of May of, of this year does address all the comments we received. Um, and to date, we've had a total of 11 community meetings on the project. Um, we are recommending that the board approve the project and certify the EIR today. Um, this project will provide a reliable water supply to 225,000 customers currently supplied by the Walnut Creek Water Treatment Plant. Um, and it does so in a way that provides resilience, sustainability, and minimizes operational risk. Um, if the board approves the project, design will be three years, uh, followed by construction of phase one, which is half capacity pretreatment for the plant, followed by, and then construction of phase two is to be determined at a later date. It will depend on future realization of demands and, and water quality. So, um, so I'll go over the recommended action, uh, and I think I'm supposed to read these, so here it goes. Uh, so certify the final EIR for the Walnut Creek Water Treatment Plant pretreatment project. Make findings in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act, including statement of overriding considerations. Adopt the mitigation, monitoring, and reporting plan in accordance with CEQA. Adopt the practices and procedures monitoring and reporting plan and approve the project. And Bill, I don't know if it's you or maybe Dave Renstrom that can best respond to the comments that, you, that we heard from the neighbors about why the, um, the pipeline pumping the, uh, the sludge away from the plant is not a feasible solution. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we did look at that, um, that concept um, after we got the letter. Uh, the, the aqueduct maintenance facility is a critical facility, and we do have existing infrastructure there. Um, we have a large pumping plant, actually two large pumping plants. We have a pg e substation, some shops, and then what you don't see, if you were to look at a, an aerial view of it, our McCullum aqueducts go through the site, and we can't build anything over that. Uh, so even though we, we could potentially build a, a pipeline to this site and pump sludge there, we actually don't have the space to process the sludge. Um, and so one, one, of the issue, one of the reasons why we have that mechanical dewatering that I talked about that's going to take the wet sludge and turn it into dry, one of the reasons why we're doing that is under peak day scenarios, if we do not have that mechanical dewatering, we will have more trucks than we can actually fill in a day, uh, on a peak day. So, um, so we would actually have to put mechanical dewatering facilities on that site, and there's just no space on the site to fit the, this infrastructure to process that sludge and turn it into dry cake for off haul. And, and how far is that facility from Walnut Creek Treatment Plant? Uh, two miles. So that would require the construction of a pipeline. Yes, yep. Um, questions, thoughts, comments, or motions? I would just like to say a few words um, since this project is in my ward and I've been intimately um, involved in this since I arrived. Um, it's been an incredible learning opportunity, a big, a big steep learning curve. Um, but I, I just want to state that, you know, I understand um, that this is a significant project and that it does have some unavoidable impacts on the neighborhood. And that as I shared with the neighbors on June 27th, 
one of the things that keeps me up at night is a scenario that could easily happen any moment. And it would be if there were to be a fire in our watershed up country and the quality of the party water were to degrade to the extent that the Walnut Creek water treatment plant would be overwhelmed. As it stands today, if that were to happen, um, we would have to restrict water deliveries to over 225,000 people for an uncertain number of days or weeks because of, of that um, scenario. And, and that frankly keeps me up at night, especially last week there was a fire in Oroville at the dam, and I was thinking, oh goodness, you know, is, is, this is the kind of situation that could potentially end up impacting us here locally. So um, I, I shared that very real concern. It, it would impact me, it would impact the neighbors, um, and, and I really hope that the improvements that we're proposing will happen before such a thing would take place. Um, so it, it's actually clear to me now that after I've studied the EIR and, and after hearing to the neighbors and listening to staff and studying everything is that it is in the best interest of the community, and including War II and beyond, um, to actually go forth and build this project, keeping the community's concerns front of mind the entire time during construction. I commit to making myself available um, to the community, along with Joe, if there are any concerns. Um, I also want to thank staff, because I know you guys went well above and beyond what you typically might do in projects to, to hit the pause button and, and allow for this extra time for um, dialogue and, and analysis. And so with that, um, I, I am comfortable moving this item forward um, and proposing that we actually um, adopt and the motions in the previous slide um, that we go forth with this. So that's a motion. That would be my motion, yes. So item 22A is to certify the final EIR report for the Walnut Creek uh, treatment plant, pre-treatment project. 22B, make findings in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, including a statement of overriding considerations. 22C, adopt the mitigation monitoring and reporting program in accordance with CEQA. 22D, adopt the practices and procedures monitoring and reporting plan. And finally, 22E, approve the project. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a motion uh, by Director Gomez, a second by Director Lenny. Are there any other questions, comments, or thoughts? All right, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed, any abstentions? All right, that moves forward unanimously. And we have to thank you all for, for coming and caring about this project so much. And we bow to do all we can going forward. So thank you. All right. That leads us to item 23, general manager's report. Yes. So um, first, we have Siobhan Tuvo, who will share with you the service for awards for the period April to June 2024. Give us one moment to get you set up. Um, go back out. It should be bookmarked. Okay. Give us one moment, Siobhan. Yes. You should be ready to click. <coughs> well, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Siobhan Tuvo, and I am with the Employee and Organization Development Team, and I have the honor of presenting the Service Award recipients for the last quarter, uh, which is April through June of 2024. And I'd like if we have any of the award uh, recipients in the room to please come forward, if you'd like. 
Um, so the employee recognition program includes uh, four elements. And that is the peer recognition program, the local celebration, and the employee recognition month, which is coming up in September, as well as uh, these awards, which are the longevity service awards. The service and retirement awards are given uh, uh, milestone years, so every five years of service, and include a district pin, certificate and gift. Employees reaching 20 years of service receive the wood and water drop. And retirees may choose to receive a belt buckle or the buckle emblem placed on a vase. Mm -hmm. And retirees with 24 or more years of service may choose to receive a wooden plaque. So we will begin with our 25 years of service recipients. Is Kevin here? Sorry, I thought Kevin might be here. Um, so you can see the names there on the screen. We have five uh, people receiving their 25-year service re um, award. Um, there are some photos there for you. We have Jimmy uh, Yule's, part of my pronunciation, and Serge uh, Tarantanith. Uh, was with him receiving his 25-year uh, certificate, as well as Dave Wallenstein receiving his as well. Our 20-year uh, award recipients, we also have five people that um, are receiving their 20-year uh, award. And you can see them there, as well as a photo of Mark Esquivel Sr. Uh, celebrating his 20-year award there while preparing for the um, annual fire training. Any 20-year award recipients? Oh, okay, yeah, you're, I think you're on the... <laughs> Are you Jennifer? Yeah. Jennifer, yes, all right. I think you're on the... Let's see, there's Jennifer. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so Jennifer is here. Thank you, Jennifer. Congratulations. Um, is Kenneth here? Okay, my apologies. Okay, so um, also uh, in the photograph there, you can see Anjali uh, Strader and Keelai, who I believe is receiving his 15 year as well. So two award recipients in that photograph. So for our 15 years of service recipients, um, we have again five people who are receiving this award. Is Key here? He said he was coming, okay. <laughs> How about William? Hi, William. Congratulations. <laughs> so William is here. Can you read their names out loud? Please? Oh, sure. I was instructed not to, but I'll be happy to. Uh, Eric Fukata from the Wastewater Treatment Superintendent, or Wastewater uh, Treatment Superintendent, my apologies. Kilai, Senior Wastewater Control Inspector. Robert Music, Electrical Technician. Justin Nickel from Party Water, Wastewater Supervisor. And William, who's here, William Sharp, Manager of Operations Maintenance Planning. Would you like me to read the uh, more tenured employees? Yes. OK, great. It would be nice to just have that on the record. Yes. So uh, our 25-year recipients, Kevin Hazlitt, a maintenance machinist, uh, Hazel Rizot Triana, an HR technician, uh, Serge, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Taryn Tief, Director of Engineering and Construction, Cam Tong, janitor, and David Wallenstein, associate civil engineer for our 25 years. And again, those are the photos we looked at earlier. 20 years of service recipients, Peter Anthony, storekeeper two, Sean Carlson, a plant inspector, as mentioned earlier, Mark Esquivel Sr., ranger, naturalist two, Sharon Hugh, manager of facilities, maintenance, and construction, and Brian Kong, chief of party. Also 20 years, Jin Lin, assistant engineer, Jennifer McGregor, senior civil engineer, James McNaughton, maintenance machinist, Kenneth Russell, instrument technician, and as mentioned earlier, Angelie Strader, supervising wastewater control representative. Uh, 15 years of service, we just took a look at. Uh, and for 10 years, uh, Lizanne Alfonso, a new business coordinator one, Fiona Au, accountant two, 
Michael Bogetti Jr., heavy equipment operator, Richard Coel Coelho, excuse me, maintenance specialist three, Troy Davis, construction inspector, and Arnold Gakusan, a material storage foreman. Arnold, are you here? Yes, congratulations, Arnold. <laughs> Is anyone else on the slide here? All right. We have uh, more 10 year uh, service recipients. Juan Herrera Jr., Assistant Wastewater Shift Supervisor, Catalina Lopez, Executive Assistant 2, Michael Maddox, Crane Operator, Leanne Maloney, Accountant 3, Derry Moten, Special Assistant 3, Veronica Mohanov, Senior Administrative Clerk, and we can see in the photograph there, Derry with General Manager Clifford Chan. Derry's here, congratulations, Derry. Also 10 years of service, Lauren Patton, Water System Inspector 2, Adrian Robinson, Survey Technician 1, Zachary Thien, Wastewater Plant Operator 2, Melody Wang, Accounting and Financial System Analyst, Christina Wong, Public Affairs Specialist, and Zahui Zhang, Senior Software Engineer. Any other? Yes? Yes. Melody, you're here. Congratulations. Thank you for coming. All right, and um, our last category are the five-year of service recipients. We have, I believe, 19 people that are receiving their five-year award. Uh, Raymond Bennett from the Water Distribution uh, Palmer One. Carla Cartagena, Senior Administrative Clerk. Herman Cazares, Jr., Water Distribution Plumber uh, Four. Thomas Christopher, Janitor. Bernadette De Leon, Management Analyst Two. Joseph Gavatsa, maintenance machinist. Here. Uh, Talia Gonzalez, HR technician. Reina Lopez, buyer two. Ryan Mackey, senior water distribution operator. Sean Moore, heavy equipment operator. Benjamin Moreno, a maintenance specialist three. Terry Ann Reed, senior construction inspector, who's uh, featured there in the photograph with Tim Karlstrand and Jason Reza as well as uh, Mitchell Ricobuono, Senior Heavy Equipment Operator. Any of those folks here? Okay. All right, and I think this is our last slide. Uh, Martin Serena, are you here? Yes, Martin. Hi, welcome, congratulations. Uh, John Smith, oh, Martin is an assistant engineer. John Smith, Water Distribution Plumber 3. Shane Sorahan, Paving Raker A. Justin Troutner, new business coordinator one. Anakani Villasenor, Kayamuloa, water system inspector two. And Scott Wagner, hydroelectric power plant operator two. Any of those folks? Well, I would like to offer congratulations to all of the service award recipients and thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Good to go. On behalf of the board, thank you guys for your service. Congratulations. Thank you, Siobhan. Congratulations. You might have noticed that I sat down that photo with Derry because otherwise I would have been out of the frame. I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, finally, just attached in the board packet is a forecast and summary of the 2024 board committee and workshop agenda topics and also the monthly report. All right. We will now move to reports and director comments, items 24 through 26. These are reports only, no action required. Are there any comments from the public on any of these items? All right, hearing none, let's move uh, to uh, reports and director comments. Planning committee. Oh, yes. Planning. Oh, yes. Planning. Yeah. Oh, so that comes yeah, under committee. committee reports next. Is that next? or yeah, Next. Okay. Um, the planning committee met this morning, and we had um, two items. Um, uh, we had the um, call create the regulator project um, agenda item that we discussed um on consent, and then we also had uh, an update on pipeline rebuild. Um, no, that was, no, pipeline rebuild. 
<laughs> hours ago. Um, uh, an update, a very impressive update from our pipeline rebuild folks on our progress, which is we exceeded our goal for this year. We're headed up to uh, 25 miles for um, the upcoming years. And um, something I'm really happy, was really very happy to hear is that we are uh, have laid our last or about to lay our last PVC pipe toxic stuff, um, and uh, are, we'll be moving uh, pretty much exclusively to ductile iron um, pipe for our um, future uh, pipeline replacement and a bunch of stuff about the, uh, you know, what we're learning about pipe failure and replacement and how to be most, you know, sort of efficient and proactive about getting ahead of replacing pipeline pipe that is... Uh, at risk of, of failure and in need of replacement. All right, thank you. Um, Ledge Human Resources met this morning. We only had one item on our agenda, and it was a very comprehensive strategic uh, plan update on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and it was just really a wonderful uh, full report that I think we appreciated mightily. Um, that moves us to other items for future consideration. Please submit them uh, to the general manager's office. And director comments, thank you if you've already submitted your written comments to the secretary. Are there any verbal director comments? I have one. Marguerite? Um, so I was I had uh, have for the last few years uh, participated in the Arinda Fourth of July parade and um, did so again this year. It was quite warm, um, uh, and I think Risha's got a picture. I just want—I have a couple pictures to show. Um, Chris, our watershed ranger, um, drove the truck, and I had my granddaughter. Whoops, taking up. It's a big picture, so maybe that's why. Can you make it smaller? So there's our truck, decorated. It's got a banner on the side, and all of this. We had a bubble machine and um, passed out uh, bubble wands and um, pop rocks, which this is a big uh, giveaway swag. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't decide. That was Joe, Joe's decision was the Pop Rocks. But um, I, I had, we had these little mini bubble wands. And then did you have the next picture? Were, were you no? inside the truck? Or? I wasn't. No. Well, I, my granddaughter, there's my granddaughter, oh, Rhea. Rhea was out handing stuff out, as was I, talking to the crowd. And the thing that I wanted to say, and um, Director Chan um, reminded me of it this morning, is we had lots of people saying, thank you, East Bay Mud. Um, and saying, you know, we love your water, we love our water, and and um, and the like. So that was that was great. Um, That's great. You're teaching your granddaughter how to glad hand already. <laughs> <laughs> She's very good at it, actually. <laughs> Looks like she enjoys it. She enjoyed handing stuff out. Usually, she is a little bit on the uh, "Where's my stuff?" But she was very happy to hand stuff out. Future politician. Any, oh, Bill, okay, you're next. Well, <clears throat> I got in a little trouble. Uh, Clifford told me uh, that it would be nice if I went to the Oakland Chamber uh, celebration that they had on the, uh, what is that? Uh, the 20, the 26th of June. And it was held at Children's Fairyland, Oakland. And, uh, they let you in? While I was reluctant, <laughs> Fairyland, yes. <laughs> while I was reluctant to go, uh, I was glad I did. And it gave me a chance to commemorate with some old, old friends. Uh, turns out that the Spanish Speaking Unity Council in Fruitvale uh, was being honored. And uh, this, the person that started them 
was the first person to greet me when I walked through the gate. <laughs> uh, Arabella Martinez. Arabella was a special assistant to the peanut president from Georgia, and all the way from Oakland. And uh, she and Lionel uh, and myself had been friends for years. Lionel was mayor then. And so she said, Bill, Bill. I heard this voice, but I looked all around. I didn't see anybody. Well, Arabella's only about that tall. <laughs> so she was little. And she just hugged me, and uh, we greeted each other. And then she walked me over to uh, Noel Gayo from the Oakland City Council. And Noel was once uh, Park and Rec Commissioner when I was over Park and Rec. And so he, he hugged me and thanked me for introducing him to the political world. And the essence of all of that was that Fairyland was symbolic because it survived uh, the gentrification of many of Oakland's treasures, which I was at one time responsible for. So uh, the other honoree was uh, Keith Carson of Alameda County. And when Keith received his award, he ran quickly to my side and they took the picture. So it, as I said, it started a movement. And after that, everybody was inviting me somewhere. And <laughs> I, I'm really trying to avoid going to too many things. But uh, it was good and refreshing and to be remembered. And one of the things that uh, I remember is that the Oakland Zoo was also mentioned. Well, I once ran the Oakland Zoo. And so the question came up of how did you manage to keep all these things? Oakland was broke, didn't have any money. I said, yeah, that's why I moved over to East Bay Mud. I retired because <laughs> they didn't have any money. And uh, the real reason for that, and it is funny, uh, I was able to talk to the top people we all know Kaiser uh, for the health plan. Well, Kaiser Industries were worldwide, and they um, had their base here in Oakland. Uh, the school that's about to close now, uh, the college, uh, Holy Names, owned the land that the Kaiser Builder is built on and everything right up to the lakefront. Well, they bought that land from the school, but they didn't buy it. They, they paid for the land, and then they built the school free of charge, the one in the hills that's about to go away now. Well, I befriended uh, the head of the president of the board of directors, and he just died about two, three months ago. And so I went to him and talked to him. He always invited me to come if there was a problem. Well, he ended up with the Kaiser donating money to a trust fund that we had set up um, in my department for running visitor services. And that money uh, was augmented by whatever the city set aside, which never was enough. Well, I was able to collect more money by taking the attractions to Clorox, to all the major users of uh, our city. And they all had money that they were going to spend in tax. Well, they could write this off and keep something good going in Oakland. And the New Oakland Committee came out of that. So all that history. That's what we're around in the corner talking about uh, where Oakland was. And then they mentioned the zoo. Well, the zoo was a state park. And the director of state parks for Oakland was William Penn Mott. Mott became the national director of parks after serving at the state level. 
it was he who, again, I went to to talk about Nolan Park, a state park. And I knew uh, a park in Southern California uh, near the Rose Bowl has been given away to that community. What happened was uh, Bill Mott said, he said, let me think about giving you some help with that. So I went to see Joe Nolan, who owned the Tribune in the Nolan building, and told him that something was afoot because his name was on the park. And he agreed that if this happened, he wouldn't raise hell about it because we had to be careful of the political. One of the things that happened is he called me and he said, I tell you what, Bill, uh, I'll make a deal with you. He said, I'll give you that, what you asked for, but it's going to cost you. And I said, how much? We don't have much money. He said, can you spare a dollar? Well, I got that whole park for the city of Oakland for a dollar. And that became the platform that we did a master plan for after moving the zoo there. And that master plan is what brought it forward. And the master plan had a funding source that has always continued. It's not the city that kept it up, it's the state. And it came down through regional parks. And that's why we have Nolan Park Zoo today. These were the kind of things that we enjoyed doing, at least I did, because I could take a small budget and have money left over at the end of the year because I could get money from outside working with the people who really cared about Oakland. And we need to get back to that. So that's one of the things that I said last week. And as a result of that, meeting over there at Fairyland, KTVU did a special on me on the 3rd. Uh, and a link has come over to Risha. She'll share that with you. And it talks about my accomplishments in Oakland. So now they woke me up, and I'm scared to go out the door. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't, I don't want to go to a thousand events and whatnot, but I thank the people. I thought I'd been forgotten, but uh, it turns out I wasn't. And yes. over here at East Bay Mud, where I hope I've made a significant contribution uh, during the years I've been here, it's ideas, it's how we think, how we dream, and how we implement. And that's one of the things that makes me say, I'm proud to know uh, Clifford uh, because he's like that too. I saw that quality in him. And we're fortunate to have a staff that rises up, up above all the other public agencies, not in Oakland, in the state, and maybe in the nation. And you should be proud that we as a board have been able to support you and give you latitude toward your operations and you have brought them through uh, all those awards that people were talking about years of service east bay mud is number one in my book and i'm proud to be here that's my report for today naacp comes up next week <laughs> <laughs> thank you bill uh -huh. any other yeah i'll just be really brief. Um, so last week, um, Clifford and Kelly and I had a meeting with the president of the Oakland Roots. It's the soccer team. And um, I think that, um, you know, it would be really great if we could have some sort of partnership with them. And I know that's what Kelly and uh, Clifford are talking about. But it was really fun. I I really enjoyed it. We uh, we went to the training facility for the Oakland Roots. Mm -hmm. And one last comment I'm going to make is if you haven't been to an Oakland Roots game, you need to apologize to yourself. <laughs> 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 and you need to go because it, it is so much fun. Um, and I go with people who who normally don't go to soccer games, not into soccer, and everyone says the same thing. It was more fun than they could have imagined. Wow. So I hope you go.
Cool. Thank you. Any other? All right. The board of directors will be on recess between July 10th and August 12th of this year. <clears throat> The next regular meeting of the Board of Directors will be held Tuesday, August 13th, 2024 at 1.15. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>